we're going to open up this conversation about um, considerations of expertise uh, in COVID with Professor Kehan Parsi. So uh, Professor Parsi uh, is the director of the graduate program in bioethics at the New Swanger Institute for Bioethics, um, he's, uh, which is at Loyola uh, University, Chicago. He's also the president-elect of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. Kehan, thanks so much for joining us today. Ryan, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I have to say, this topic of expertise is something that's fascinated me for, for many, many years. So what I'd like to do is put this idea, this concept of expertise into some kind of historical context and also distinguish it from some other categories that we often talk about. So first, a historical context. I'd like to start off with this quote by the sociologist Paul Starr, who wrote uh, the famous book, The Social Transformation of American Medicine back in the 1980s. And so here's the quote. He says in his book, the dream of reason did not take power into account. The dream was a reason in the form of the arts and sciences would liberate humanity from scarcity and the caprices of nature, ignorance and superstition, tyranny, and not least of all, the diseases of the body and the spirit. And so the reason I like to start off with that quote by Starr is because I think it in some ways encapsulates some of the tension, some of the challenges that we're facing as a society today. Uh, the dream of reason, which was born from the enlightenment was this notion that if we privilege reason above over everything else, if we um, uh, allow ourselves our, our kind of our rational uh, framework to analyze and to uh, address issues in society, we can resolve a number of challenges, whether they're uh, how we govern ourselves, whether they're issues related to science or medicine. Um, and in hindsight now, we realize that that is a very naive notion, that of course, power is something that we always have to contend with. And so when we talk about expertise, we can't view expertise in just this kind of um, historical vacuum. Um, there have been this ongoing tension in American culture for the last 100, 200 years, um, that this tension between this uh, commitment to rationality, to reason, to cultivating expertise, and then on the other hand, this kind of strand of anti-expertise or even anti-intellectualism. And this has been documented by um, other scholars such as uh, Richard Hofstadter who wrote his famous book about anti-intellectualism in American life back in the 60s. And so we have this kind of ongoing tension between this commitment to reason, this commitment to rationality um, on the one hand, which has brought us so many wonderful things, um, especially in areas related to healthcare and medical science, but also this um, strong counter current. It's, and we've seen it in different parts of American history. So uh, one good example is um, the era of Jacksonian democracy in the early part of the 19th century, Andrew Jackson, um, who the previous president actually looked up to as an exemplar of who he wanted to aspire to. Um, under Jackson's administration, um, a lot of things were rolled back. Uh, licensure of healthcare professionals, physicians, and so forth were rolled back. And there was this hostility towards expertise, towards the notion that um, a certain elite group of people could um, create standards, whether we're talking about standards in medical science or in ethics. Um, and, and, and we've seen, again, these kind of currents come up, certainly in the last several years. Uh, we've seen this current, this strain of anti-expertise, anti-intellectualism. Anti um, so I think this is something to kind of keep in mind as we are dealing with this current challenge of COVID, the pandemic. Um, that um, it's not an easy kind of, of scenario where we can just defer to the expertise of authorities. And we've seen how challenging that is, that despite um, all of the pronouncements that have been made by experts in science, medicine, public health, we still have a great deal of opposition to that kind of thinking. And, and so it's something that I think we have to be um, cognizant of and understand that there are deep historical roots to this tension. 
Thank you, Ken. That, that's super helpful in placing um, our broad conversation within the historical context for where we're going to go, um, I think is it, it, it's essential to getting these things right. So we've got a bunch of bioethics questions for you too, but we're going to work through our panelists and then we'll loop back in the Q&A and sort of try to pull out some of the bioethical themes from that kind of historical context. Um, so I want to move now um, to our second uh, panelist, Professor Jennifer Oliva, uh, who's an associate professor of law uh, and the director of the Center for Health and Pharmaceutical Law at uh, Seton Hall uh, Law School at Seton Hall University. Uh, Jen, great to have you here. Um, so we've got this broad historical context. We're now going to sort of go a bit more specific to a particular profession. So you've created uh, this now famous course on uh, COVID ethics and the law at Seton Hall Law School. You've been thinking a lot about the role of lawyers, legal boundaries within the, um, within the conversations of pandemics. So help us think through from a legal perspective, um, what should be on our minds in analyzing expertise? Thank you for having me, Dr. P. It's an absolute privilege to be on here. I'm a huge fan of the series and um, remarkable co-panelists. Uh, so in the spirit of the topic at hand, am I on mute? A, a tech, yep, you're all good, you're all good. Okay. I was just giving a disclaimer that I'm going to try to stick to the little bit of expertise that, that I might might have, which is public health law. And I'm going to talk about two things, uh, how a small group of elites, to Dr. Parsi's point, called the Supreme Court, which are nine legal experts, has have historically deferred to public health evidence and expertise when deciding challenges to public health orders um, during contagious disease outbreaks. And then I'm gonna talk about how and why the court appears now to be less enthusiastic about continuing that longstanding tradition and it's recently decided COVID cases. This is concerning to me because the Supreme Court's expertise lies in legal interpretation and not in scientific and medical determinations. For over a century, the Supreme Court has played a critical role in balancing individual liberty rights against the state's authority to issue public health orders that restrict those rights to prevent or mitigate infectious disease outbreaks. Individuals challenging these orders have brought a litany of claims. Some are rooted in the First Amendment's rights to free exercise of religion, free speech, freedom of assembly. For example, individuals who challenge uh, orders that limit the right to mass gathering or in-person uh, religious services. Other claims are grounded in a 14th, the 14th Amendment, liberty interest. For example, individuals have brought claims uh, under their right to travel when um, states have issued quarantines and um, the right to bodily integrity and the very famous um, compulsory vaccination cases I'm gonna talk about. Important to the topic of judicial expertise in this um, context is the landmark case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts, which the Supreme Court decided 115 years ago, 116 years ago now uh, in 1905. Largely due to mass European migration to the Northeastern American cities at the turn of the 19th century, that region of the country experienced a considerable outbreak of smallpox, which is a contagious and quite deadly disease. Uh, that included, of course, the city of Boston, which was a big immigration uh, entry point to the United States. The neighboring city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, which has a couple of very small, uh, famous colleges in it, decided to issue a compulsory vaccination law. Cambridge resident and Lutheran pastor Hennings Jacobs refused the vaccine, and he was fined $5 under the law. Jacobson had received a vaccine when he was six years old in his native home country of Sweden and had a poor reaction to it. So he was opposed to getting this smallpox vaccine in Cambridge in 1902. He also had was bolstered by significant religiosity in his objection to the vaccine. In his brief to the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, he literally asked the court the following question, quote, can the free citizen of Massachusetts who is not yet pagan nor an adulterer be compelled to participate in this new, no revived form of worship of the sacred cow. The sacred cow to which he refers was the smallpox vaccine itself, which is derived from the pus of smallpox boils that are on the bellies of calves. In fact, the word vaccine comes from the Latin word vaca, which means cow. Jacobson is in effect saying that the vaccination law in Cambridge was imposing paganism on him by forcing him to inject into his body animal material, in this case, cow. Jacobson appeals his case all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States and he loses. 
Justice Harlan's opinion is nuanced, famous, and controversial in its interpretation. There's no way I could get into all of those ins and outs now for the legal experts out there. Suffice it to say, it makes three important points for our talk today. First, neither an individual's liberty interest nor the state's police power to issue public health um, orders is unconstrained or unlimited. Okay, there's limitations both ways. In fact, Justice Harlan says you can't really have freedom or liberty without public health and well being. Second, Harlan creates a malleable balancing test that says states can enact public health orders that do constrain individual liberty interests so long as they're reasonable, proportional, non discriminatory they don't target a particular group, and they don't harm one individual's health, which gives us vaccine exemptions. Third, and most importantly today, the, the decision is clear that in evaluating a state or locality's public health order, the courts are to defer to public health expertise. Justice Harlan, in fact, goes out of his way in that decision to say that the public health evidence overwhelmingly established that the vaccine was effective against smallpox. Fast forward 115 years to the COVID-19 pandemic, the first couple of decisions that this court decided in the spring and summer of 2020 followed tact. They were free exercise, free exercise clause cases challenging government restrictions on in-person attendance at religious services. Pointing to Jacobson, the court refused to enjoin those government orders and the government prevailed. On September 18th, 2020, however, Justice Ginsburg passed away. She was quickly replaced by a more conservative justice. So the balance of the court changed. The first court case that was heard after Justice Ginsburg passed away and Justice Barrett came onto the court, it's called Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn versus Cuomo right in our backyard here. And that was a religious challenge case to Governor Cuomo's orders capping the number of people who attend religious, religious services in New York City. The court flipped and decided in favor of the religious petitioners in that particular case. This case is important because the court explicitly broke with Jacobson and held that worship services cannot be treated differently than secular events, regardless of the epidemiological evidence presented about COVID risks that attend to those various different events. Justice Sotomayor points it out in her forcible dissent that this is concerning, and she warns the public, quote unquote, justices of this court play a deadly game and second guessing the expert judgment of health officials. Thank you, Jen. Super helpful framing, right? So we have the broad historical view from Kahan. We have the detailed legal analysis. And um, I know you could go into a lot more depth. We appreciate you keeping it short, but just of what the relevant case law is and how, um, with this big question about the proper role of Supreme Court expertise, um, sort of how things have gone legally. Excellent, thank you. We're gonna, again, Tons of questions coming in, but we're going to turn to um, our third panelist. Just so we have all of our views and all the perspectives on the table. Our third panelist is Chelsea Barrett. Uh, Chelsea is uh, a librarian. Um, she's a business librarian and the Africana Studies Librarian at Seton Hall University Libraries. Chelsea, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, so Chelsea, you work every day with students, uh, with faculty who are trying to do some more research, trying to understand different kinds of information, um, new to information systems, some more experienced. As someone who works with folks trying to find good information, help us through thinking about expertise in light of this pandemic. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Dr. Pilkington and the IHS Library and the wonderful panelists. I'm so honored to be here. Um, so to answer your question, I mean, libraries do a lot. I know that we're kind of talking about libraries and how they function, but we also have the archives. We have a lot of initiatives that we've been doing in terms of COVID. So um, we've been not only finding resources, but providing resources as well. Um, but to talk about how we navigate as librarians, um, we are called liaison librarians. So we have certain areas that we focus on. So like you see, I have business and Africana studies, but in addition, we do other things and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. I know trying to consolidate the library experience in five minutes is so hard, um, but ultimately we do a lot. We are also faculty. So we go and we teach classes. And one of the things that I found in terms of expertise in libraries is attacking the mass and widespread disinformation that was going on during COVID-19. And I think we all experienced it. You know, we're all on social media. We all heard word of mouth, certain things that have been since debunked and didn't have any medical expertise or knowledge behind it. 
And that was something that I found in teaching classes. And a lot of the students had to pick topics for their courses. And the professors were focusing on COVID-19, which is great. However, when students were picking their topics, they were picking things that they saw on social media and that they heard. And they would come to me and say, I can't find information on this. And I had to explain to them the reason is because this is not true. You have been a victim of misinformation. And throughout COVID-19, because it is so volatile and so new, there were so many things going around and nobody knew fact from fiction. And to this day, we still don't know fact from fiction on a lot of things. And that's where expertise comes into play. So what I like to do <clears throat> is defer all of these things to the experts. Look at what the World Health Organization is saying. Look what experts in the field are saying. Are they actually supporting what you're finding on social media or are they not? And that helped to give them a distinction between what is actual information and what is misinformation. But it was so hard because again, new things were coming out just about every day. Sometimes they would say, this is helpful. No, it's not. So it was a matter of keeping up with things. And librarians in particular, we actually have a, quite a few on our staff that would compile resources and, you know, continually go back and vet those sources and check on you know the updates and then refer students to that. Um, so that is something that we do. We like to be the bridge to the experts, but we also have expertise in our own house. And you can go on our website, look at our blog. We have a lot of initiatives that we did, um, preserving the oral history of COVID-19 and, you know, just so that we can go back and reference it in the future. Um, something else to talk about is not only do we do our jobs here as librarians, we do a lot outside of Seton Hall as well. And I'll talk about something that I've been doing. Um, ever since last year, myself and about 130 librarians were part of the Library Reserve Corps, which is um, via the World Health Organization. So we've been working in conjunction with a response team from the World Health Organization. And we've been taking our time to consolidate information, articles, correspondences, um, even opinions from experts, consolidating them in one place so that the experts can come and vet that information for themselves to create an efficient process so that they can get to what they need. And we do the work that we were trained to do, right? Librarians as a profession, we are trained to find sources, vet them, see if they're credible or accurate, and then move forward in that way. So, I mean, we've been doing this for about a year. I'm still involved in this and it's um, continuing to grow. We have people from the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, all over the world. And I'm assuming it's continuing to grow and it's been such a wonderful initiative. So, um, I guess to sum up everything that I'm saying, because I can go on for days, um, librarians and the archives, we do so many things. But what I will say is librarians, not only are we experts in ourselves, but we are also the bridge to the experts in the field. And during COVID-19, it's been really important that we defer people and guide them on the right path to the right information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chelsea. That, that's so helpful. And I know everyone calling in knows because I've noted this with each panelist. It's so hard to say all that you could say and share with us in a few minutes. So again, <laughs> folks, do feel free to tweet any additional questions at us and check out our resource page. Um, it's on the Seton Hall, the IHS Library website, and we'll have more resources there and we can sort of continue this conversation. So thanks, Chelsea. I mean, the, the kinds of virtues that librarians possess, my, my students on the line, of course, have Aristotle echoing in the back of their heads, but the kind of virtues you all possess in disentangling what is sort of accurate information, what's not, and really just um, taking time and all the work you do. I know we're all um, all very grateful for it. Um, on that Aristotelian note, um, I'd like to transition to our next panelist, um, Peter Wicks. So Peter Wicks is uh, the scholar in residence at the Elm Institute. Um, he is a philosopher. So Peter, we've got big, heavy philosophical questions. What is expertise? How do we think through these? What's going on in the pandemic from this perspective? So just your reflections broadly on expertise um, and thinking through this would be super helpful. 
Uh, great, thank you, Brian. Um, so I'll, I'll try and be brief, but um, make some points which I hope will be useful. Uh, the first one is uh, the panel title is COVID-19 and the crisis of expertise. And in my view, um, the problem that uh, are most relevant here were already there. The, the pandemic has sort of highlighted and raised the stakes, but by the time it arises, there's already a crisis of expertise. Um, and what's going on there is we're becoming more aware of the extent of our dependence on expert judgment, how much of the things we know or we think we know, we know because somebody told us. And we're becoming more self-conscious about that because we are for good reason. Um, becoming worried about the question of how you distinguish genuine expertise um, from fake expertise. Um, I'll mention one book I found very helpful on this, which is Martin Gurry's The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority in the New Millennium. And Gurry mentions uh, social media and uh, more broadly technologies which allow individuals to broadcast as doing two things. Um, one, they remove the monopoly um, on the dissemination of information that used to belong uh, to sort of large media companies. And two, by making individuals able to participate, albeit usually in quite a small way, um, in the broadcasting and dissemination of information, they become more aware of the dynamics that lead uh, some ideas to sort of uh, spread more rapidly than others. Um, and for good reason, they get worried about uh, the process by which somebody gets on their TV screen and pronounces confidently about um, a top topic of which they're concerned. So I'll mention a few of the challenges uh, that we face as individuals. Uh, one, we tend to underestimate the specificity of expertise. So one of the things that makes COVID-19 so difficult is there aren't experts on COVID-19 and non-experts. There are experts on this or that aspect of this complex phenomenon. Um, and so we actually need to bring together uh, the knowledge of a variety of different experts and then figure out how to integrate into an accurate account of what's going on. And that's hugely difficult. Um, often you actually need to be quite close to a particular domain of knowledge to be able to kind of reliably spot the signs of a genuine expert um, and somebody who is an expert in something but not the thing that they're talking about. Um, we underestimate the difficulty of measurement. Um, a lot of people have been looking for the experts to pronounce on uh, sort of various aspects of the disease that just can't be known yet because we're studying it in real time. Uh, people have been asking, so how long the vaccines will be effective for? And the answer is, well, we can't know that yet. You know, we're still waiting for that information. Um, and I think that the popular image of science is one where if the resources of scientific inquiry are sort of marshaled and directed a certain topic, it will sort of reveal itself uh, and all its inner workings almost immediately. And just some of the things that we study aren't like that. Um, and finally, uh, human beings just in general are really bad at, at thinking probabilistically. Um, we like to be told what is going to be is going to happen or what is not going to happen. Um, and that's especially true when it comes to risk. Um, and so the, the temptation is always to make confident pronouncements. Um, and I think we need to get better, uh, both as sort of consumers of uh, news and information and those who sort of stand up and address the public need to be better as providers of information at trying to calibrate and speak in terms of relative degrees of confidence rather than this is what we know and everything else is pure ignorance. Um, I only have a few more minutes, so uh, a few pieces of practical advice and then one sort of brief remark about the ethics of, of being a public expert. Um, in general, speed is the enemy of accuracy. Um, so getting, so getting news uh, from sources which are trying to give you up to the minute information um, unless it's something which is very time critical, is likely to be a bad place to go for the information. Going to places where they can be more thorough and more synthetic um, is likely to be a better bet. Um, slow information sources won't necessarily be better, but at a certain degree of speed, you'll almost inevitably get unreliability. Um, we should attend to questions about how things have been discovered. Um, we don't necessarily need to be an expert to be able to ask the question, is this at least the kind of thing an expert could know? Um, and 
finally, we should be wary of the temptation uh, to politicize issues unnecessarily. Um, and there are various things we mean by politicization, but in this context, I mean making beliefs uh, tied to our sense of cultural identity. Um, and you could see this happening with, for instance, the mask debate. That there's, no, there's no earthly reason why that had to become a political shibboleth, um, but it did. And once it's done that, uh, people will succumb to the temptation to adopt a position they want to for reasons of affiliation and a sense of their political identity. And then rather than deferring to expert judgment, they'll go and find an expert who will confirm a belief they're holding for other reasons. Um, it's an understandable temptation, but it's utterly uh, pernicious in this context. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to say about the ethics of expert communication is I think we've seen communication which has been too short-sighted in its calculation of consequences. Um, there have been things which were said um, and I, I mean, in particular, thinking about some of the in initial public messaging about masking, um, which was said for reasons of political expediency and then walked back. And even if you were to grant that the messaging should be dictated by a calculation of consequences, it seems to me we've seen a focus on short term consequences over long term consequences. Um, the about face on the messaging about uh, masking in public, I think, has made it that much harder in subsequent conversations for people to take um, experts' uh, advice and recommendations at face value. Um, additionally, I just think we should, it, it's one thing to sort of choose your emphasis based on uh, what you think will be most effective, but to actively misrepresent uh, your best understanding um, of the science uh, for the sake of short term um, expediency is just. Uh, a, a bad way to, to relate to the general public um, for reasons that go beyond uh, the cost benefit analysis. Lots more to say, but I'm at my time. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. I mean, some super helpful uh, philosophical reflections on the notion of expertise. And we're gonna get back to in the Q and A because there's some people coming in and asking about this, um, sort of the challenge of speed, right? Human beings don't reason well um, or as well as we could in situations of uncertainty and the pressing time, right? I mean, I think pushes to some errors. Where I'd like to go to first, um, and so now we've officially entered question and answer. Please folks send uh, chat, feel free to chat questions in um, to the moderator, please, uh, to the host, and please feel free to tweet questions at us. You can email ethics at shoe.edu. Uh, we've got that up, or you can tweet questions at me at BCP ethics or at shoe bioethics. Um, so the first question, I'm going to turn back to Professor Parsi. So, Kehan, we've had a couple of interesting questions come in asking about um, healthcare ethics consultation, the role of healthcare ethics committees. So as someone who teaches uh, medical students, as someone who's been involved in sort of considerations of healthcare ethics consultation, um, here's the big question. What role, one of a few big questions, what role should healthcare ethics consultants play in debunking myths about COVID-19 and vaccines circulating on social media and in our communities. So I'll start with you. I'll broaden it out to the other panelists after if they have questions, but really in light of the role of healthcare ethics consultants, what's the job for debunking myths on social media and, and other sort of broader spaces? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, we typically think of the role of the healthcare ethics consultant fairly narrowly. So when we look at, say, the kind of work that ethics consultants do in a hospital setting, in a clinical setting, it's usually uh, resolving ethics conflicts at the bedside, uh, typically between patients or family members and um, clinicians that are caring for them. Um, and so, so this question is an interesting one because we don't typically think of ethics consultants as having this professional obligation of addressing you know, misinformation that's circulating out there in the general public. However, um, I think as people who are committed to, um, you know, important values such as um, honesty, transparency, um, I think it's important for us to, um, you know, take seriously when we are confronted by this kind of information to address it. You know, so if say, you know, you're dealing with, um, in fact, I just had this, this, um, example this morning with one of my doctoral students who was presenting uh, her capstone and she was talking about how in her health system they've had patients who not only 
uh, were skeptical, say, of the vaccine, but were skeptical of COVID. That you know, they they literally had they were literally in the ICU and they didn't believe that COVID was the reason that that's why they were in the ICU. That that's why they were uh, dying. And you know, in those kinds of situations, I don't know if if trying to um, kind of disabuse people of their misperception is really the, the the highest priority. You know, because you're dealing with someone who is in you know the the last throes of life, and so I'm not sure if that's the best opportunity to address these. But I do think that um, in general, when we're talking to a broader audience, and I'm reminded of the ASBH Code of Ethics, one of the provisions talks about communicating responsibly. Um, when communicating in the public arena, consultants should clarify whether they're acting in their HCC role and should communicate in a manner consistent with the norms and obligations of the profession. So, so I think when we're talking to a broader audience, whether it's through social media, through our publications, uh, or through these kinds of webinars, I think we want to be very clear that um, our role is to ensure that we are committed to these norms of, of truth, uh, factual based or fact based information, um, and that we want to ensure that people are going to uh, appropriate sources for their information. So it really depends on what kind of role we're playing with regards to ethics consultants. You know, I, I would I would be careful in the clinical context, but if we're talking to a broader audience, I would be more receptive to trying to uh, address these kinds of issues. Karen, thank you. Super helpful, right? I mean, and raises big questions about professional roles and in what spaces uh, folks perform, which kind of functions, sort of bifurcations between our personal obligations to the world and how we interact as human beings, but also the specific things we need to do um, as those of us who are um, healthcare, consult healthcare ethics consultants at the bedside. So really helpful and hopefully to the question that, that answered that. Um, I wanna shift our focus a little bit um, and I wanna uh, direct a question to Professor Oliva. So this has just um, come in and it's a big question, but the questioner kindly summed it up in a short line. Um, so the balance, so the questioner is asking about the balance between personal choice and the possibility of endangering others um, and the health of others who don't go in for that particular person's choice. So it's really a, I make certain claims based on my religious traditions and practices, act in certain ways. How do we think about those liberty tensions from a legal perspective in light of the fact that other folks come from different traditions, philosophical, religious, whatever they may be, and have different kinds of decisions? So the questioner did a better job than I've done trying to sum it up. Does that, Jen, does that make sense? I mean, how do we do that given that when we act in certain ways, which we think folks have the liberty to do, there are potential harms for other people? Right. And the general, this is such a good question. I have a couple things to say about it. One is that, you know, the general way we would look at this is to make sure that religion or a particular religion was not getting targeted, right? So certain folks weren't allowed to do certain things, whereas others were getting, and this has happened in public health law, a really famous case, Chuho versus Williamson, which was decided in 1900. The city of San Francisco had bubonic plague. They decided to target the Chinese immigrants in the city, and they just quarantined them. Chuho challenged that. He was a merchant in Chinatown. He was losing his business. And the court so this is absolutely discriminatory. It's nonsensical. It's not rational. Here's where bubonic plague is. Why are you only targeting these people? We would see absolutely the same thing and more in a religious context here. So it's important to remember you're sort of saying, is the government being fair to everyone? This has kind of gotten twisted up now in the cases that I'm telling you about, where um, we're now saying well, we're going to take scientific evidence of the differences between particular kinds of places out of the equation now. And just, and just across the board, if you're discriminating, if you're saying religious gatherings, you know, can't have this many people, but we'll allow you to go to Safeway and we'll allow more people in the Safeway or the shop, right? Um, th that's absolutely discriminatory on its face. That's not how these things have been um, evaluated in the in the past, um, you know, from an eth ethical perspective. Let me just say a couple real quick things to people to try to shock them. And that's that I'm always shocked as a lawyer. And that's the only training I have, folks, about how upset people have been throughout COVID by the individual liberty restraints. But they're not upset about longstanding ways in which the government is incredibly intrusive into your body. For example, it is perfectly legal in Constitution constitutional for this government to forcibly conscript you into service to defend the nation 
So they can not only make you go into service and bear arms, but they can make you literally murder other people in the name of the state. And when you start thinking about that and you start comparing it to this kind of thing, you know, where you go back to old English common law, one of the oldest laws in the books is you can't use your property in a way that harms others. So you can't just sit on your property and pollute or make a bunch of noise. It's sort of the oldest common law things on the books because why? Other people have a right to enjoy their property as well. There are all of these notions built into the law um, that have ethical challenges especially when you start talking about med bodily integrity and medical rights. Um, but so I think that it's been very interesting to me how um, so people have really zeroed in on this here. And um, I, I do think it lacks the sort of back, the common law uh, historical uh, strengths that the state has had to detain human bodies, put people in prison, conscript them in the service, have them shoot at other people, uh, and all sorts of other things. Uh, Jen, that's super helpful. And um... Sim I, I'm shocked similarly. And it's, I mean, the, one of the really um, great things about having such excellent panelists here and helping us all as a group practically reason through these complicated ethical matters is it helps us see from different perspectives, uh, potential points in our own thinking of consistencies and inconsistencies and how we might work through those. And on that note, I want to switch to, so if I, I may be a little bit naive here, um, but I think lots of folks are trying to do well and we just you know, get certain facts wrong. We make mistakes about maybe some of our goals, but also how we get there. So if that's why we see some of these tensions, people aren't thinking as broadly or as clearly as they should. I wanna shift things back to Chelsea and Peter. And I'll start with Chelsea to move to Peter for the bigger question. But if folks aren't thinking as well as they should about some of these things, right? Given the history, given some of these inconsistencies, uh, we have a questioner, uh, one of our other wonderful librarians who wrote in describing an assignment where science students are given um, the task of finding in newspaper articles particular facts and then rooting out the evidence. And apparently they, they face a good, of, a good bit of distress because they can't find relevant evidence. So Chelsea, in thinking about folks being inconsistent, um, in thinking about sort of the challenges that some of our students see and not really finding the information that's out there, any advice about what students, what all of us can do in light of the fact that we see all sorts of different views, but they're not well-grounded in evidence. Folks haven't Sorry, this probably, folks haven't like gone to the library, right, in the right sort of way. So any advice for the students and the rest of us thinking through this stuff? Sure. Um, well, first and foremost, thank you to the librarian who sent in that question. Um, if you do have any questions that are of a medical or scientific backing, we have librarians that are specifically for that. So that would be my first um, point of advice, you know, go to them, they can help you. Um, I would also encourage you to, like I said, in my talk, kind of go through some of the sources and see, you know, which sources have, you know, the experts backing the information, see what they're saying and how it's evolving and keep up with that. Maybe have like a set list of sources that you're using. And then keep going back to that and and then you can use that to bridge your own knowledge because we are you know going in the philosophical route we all we're all sentient beings we have the ability to think for ourselves however it is good to have that backing see what they're saying and then move forward in that way but if you really want to just kind of have a conversation with someone and say okay i think i know can you make sure that I'm going in the right direction? I would encourage you use the library. We have a lot of resources. Um, our science librarian is fantastic. Our medical librarians and our nursing librarians are fantastic and they are more than willing to help you. But I think that doing your own work and then also using the library is the best way to go. Chelsea, thank you. That's great. And the, um, I'm able to just record this and play it for my students before each of the class, right? Because we're always sending um, folks to the excellent librarians uh, at Seton Hall and um, up at the IHS campus. So you mentioned um, the, sort of the big philosophical question. So now we turn to the philosopher. Um, Peter, in your comments, which were really helpful, you highlighted um, a challenge of speed. So this is what the students, again, students on the line who email me at midnight and say, oh my gosh, I didn't get to the library. What? Right. So everything gets rushed. Can you help us think through expertise in light of the time crunch? Is there an ethical obligation for folks to pause and to take some more time so we don't reason to 
incorrect or wrong results. We've got constant time pressures. Like, help us think through that bit of it. Uh, sure. No, th I think this this gets to something very fundamental here. Um, you asked, if, is there an obligation to pause? I, I think there's a prior question, which is, um, why do you want to know this in the first place? And one of the things that gets us into trouble is a culture which actively encourages us to form and express more opinions than we could possibly hold in an informed way. Uh, so, you know, right now we're focusing on, on COVID, but I'm thinking of all the background opinions and discussions people are getting into where they feel a little bit sort of unequipped unless they can sort of confidently pronounce, um, but they have to take shortcuts because they're overextended. Um, I mean, Chelsea emphasized the work that goes in to forming an opinion. It won't necessarily be an expert opinion, but it will be informed by experts. You know, you yourself won't be an expert, but you've identified people who can be at least comparatively reliable source of information. That, that takes time. And so I think the first question is, does it really matter if I get this right? And if it's not worth putting the time in, the healthier stance is just to recognize you don't know. Um, and so one thing I, I, th I mean, we should encourage our students to, to learn and to gather knowledge, but we should also encourage them to be realistic about how much knowledge any human being can have and then allocate their time in a thoughtful and intentional way. Um, and so learning to be comfortable saying, I don't know, helps to free up the time to then do the work to develop an informed opinion in those cases where that's a thing worth having. Um, so, so does that, Sort of respond. I mean, there's, there's sort of more to it than that. Um, I, I do think taking a pause um, is important, and partly to take that reflection. Sort of, what exactly is at stake? Um, in the case of COVID, quite lots at stake. This is definitely something worth developing informed opinions about. Um, but we have to sort of find a way of making that time. Um, it doesn't help the student who's got an essay due at nine a.m. who's emailing you at midnight. Um, there, there, the response has to be, well, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. For, I'm, I'm just going to forward the students to you before they get okay. late at night. Um, I mean, that's, that's really helpful. And there are, um, I mean, for lots of folks are sending in bioethics themed questions. I mean, there's excellent examples of these kinds of pauses in work in general, right? Um, and so as someone who has spent some time in hospitals recently, I've been very grateful for the excellent nurses who have done the timeouts, right? And so there are in different practices, right, the pausing to get things right and an excellent point, right? I mean, there's, there's so much that folks and students, so we talk about this, right? So much information that comes at all of us constantly daily, being able to not just do the kind of work that's needed, but also being able to prioritize. Well, it matters if you get the questions you have about COVID right or wrong. Um, and I take it from you and from some of the other comments, especially with, with Chelsea had raised, one of the great benefits of being in communities is being able to rely on other folks. We don't, you don't need all expertise about everything, right? Um, as is illustrative of this, this excellent panel. Um, so I'm going to move to um, another question, which is a, it's a tough question. And I believe it's a, it's a good one um, as we work through um, this conversation. It's tough because I think it's going to require multiple perspectives. So the question that came in is, what's the role of hospital ethics committees, of clinical ethicists? And I think we can broaden this out um, to legal folks, to other ethicists, to folks working through these things in pandemic preparation, right? So we've seen a lot of the um, sort of post-mortem, this is what we could have done better kind of thing. And I believe that motivates this question. So what's the role for these folks, or you might all take it your own roles in thinking about pandemic preparation, um, allocation protocols, other kinds of policies and general practices. So the questioner's thinking about visitation restrictions, um, thinking about different kinds of communications with family in, um, in hospital settings and other settings. So I'm gonna turn to Professor Parsi first, but then I'm gonna go through um, the rest of the panelists. So Kehan, lots of strict hospital visit visitation policies. Uh, like the questioner, I've gone through this recently and I'm super interested in this. So uh, what's the job of say a clinical ethicist, a hospital ethics, uh, committee, sort of how should we think through these kinds of things? Well, I can say, first of all, that this is not new. I mean, we have a wealth of resources and information that have been around for many years, many decades. Um, you know, we act as if every new challenge that we confront is a de novo challenge. And in fact, 
you know, with public health, I mean, the, the wonderful thing about public health is that there is a long tradition of addressing a variety of crises. Of course, you know, everyone talks about the, the Spanish flu epidemic uh, of 1918, uh, but, you know, over the last century, we've had so many other challenges, whether it's uh, polio or the eradication of smallpox, um, or more recently, uh, HIV AIDS, SARS. So I think one thing that as a, you know, someone who's trained in law, medical humanities, clinical ethics is that public health has really done an amazing job. And I think part of it is that uh, we should rely, going back to the theme of this webinar, we should rely as much as possible on the expertise of public health authorities, um, of the experts who have been dealing with these issues for many, many years. Um, you know, part of it is that in, in training um, folks in clinical ethics, bioethics, I don't know if we do a very good job. So when you ask what should we be doing, um, I don't think we necessarily have the training or the resources, but there are people who do and we should seek them out. And I, I can say, um, you know, just as an example, here in Chicago, um, over a year ago, uh, a coalition of clinical ethicists, bioethicists, uh, physicians, nurses, a variety of folks just came together kind of organically, but under the leadership of, of one of our colleagues at Northwestern to have uh, regular Zoom sessions to talk about all of these issues, you know, to talk about disaster preparedness and pandemic preparedness and, um, you know, triage, um, ventilator allocation, um, and now vaccine allocation. So I think what's, um, what's very helpful for those of us that work um, in clinical ethics, that serve on ethics committees, is that even though we may not necessarily be trained in these areas, there are people that, ha that have been trained and there's so many resources. And so um, so I think it's just incumbent upon us again to, to go to the right source, to find out what's been done in the past. Um, and I think that, you know, my, I guess my biggest issue is that we really suffer great from historical amnesia. And I think if we had a, a richer sense of history, whether it's public health or uh, pandemic preparedness, I think we wouldn't have been caught so off guard. And, and of course, if we had better leadership, um, but I think we would have been caught off so uh, off guard. So that's kind of my response to how uh, members of ethics committees, people doing clinical ethics consultation, is that you know there are resources, there are experts, we need to rely on them. Thank you. I'm gonna modify the question a bit and turn to uh, Professor Oliva. So you've taught this awesome, like I said before, now famous uh, COVID legal course. So for lawyers for actually for the students of law who are looking to what could be a future pandemic, um, what might happen, um, how do you think about sort of the post-mortem for folks thinking about these things through a legal perspective? What should folks be preparing for? What are the legal obligations of boards or, or, or whoever it might be? It's a big question. So in a short bit, take a crack at it because we're, we're getting a little tight on time. I'm going to say two things really quick, and hopefully Dr. Wicks will agree with me because I really loved what he said. And to ask a different question, or there's a precursor question to that. And so we got ourselves in a lot of these problems, right? Because we didn't have, we have to make tough decisions when we don't have infrastructure in place. And we have, and as Dr. Farsi just said, learn the lessons of history. If you look at some other cultures and countries who have had recent infectious disease outbreaks, and the public has felt like they had poor leadership and the government did a bad job, Taiwan, for example, or Singapore, you saw a lot of compliance up front in those cultures and communities because people had a recent history with this and wanted a different outcome this time around. So that's one thing that I would say about public health. I will also add, um, I also agree with Dr. Farsi, but mostly because he knows way more about this uh, than me and um, this is about expertise. But one of the other lessons that we've really learned legally is there's always a lot of fights about privacy and whether we could track people from a public health perspective and surveillance. And that was a big part of the course because then the laws all involved there. And um, many of these tracking devices and contact tracing and app, digital or otherwise, failed. And the postmortem right now looks like one of the reasons why is because Google and Apple and these com companies develop public health tools without the input 
of on the ground, boots on the ground, public health officials. And so they weren't structured in the right way. They weren't devised in a way that could work on the ground, et cetera. That seems like an egregious unforced error, but we see this repeatedly over and over again in this context. So those are kind of the, the two big points I would make because I want to give other folks an opportunity. Thank you. And I'm going to take the, the moderator's abusive power to shift the question slightly as I turn to, to Chelsea and Peter. We just had a great question come in, which really asks, um, it's about communication and how to convey accurately um, what particular views are. So the questioner rightly points that any of us could have talked forever on a particularly nuanced topic, and we all have fairly nuanced views from our own disciplinary perspective. But the public broadly or specific students we get asked in class or in library consultations, think of things in a more binary fashion, right? Well, is it this or is it no, right? Or sorry, is it yes or is it no? So Peter, it, quickly, in, in a minute, is there a way that we can boil down all the nuance of, you know, philosophy in a quick binary? I mean, help, but what do we do? What do we do in response to this challenging question? Uh, the answer is no. Um, so, so, um, uh, but let me give you the more complicated answer. There, there's, a, there's a quite famous sketch I like by a, a British comedy duo where they invite a physicist onto a morning talk show and say, you know, you've made this incredible breakthrough. Can you sum it up in layman's terms? He just says no. No, can't. Um, but I, I think there are things that we can do. Um, I think you're right. The, 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 the public's default is to, is to like sort of binaries and very clear cut questions. Um, there's limits to how much nuance you can int introduce, but it's not nothing. Um, and I do think there are exercises we can, we can do in an educational way to learn to get people to take a certain pride in their ability to recognize there are places you can occupy between total ignorance and complete conviction. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not a comfortable place. It doesn't come very naturally, but it's a habit that can be acquired. And I think it's a habit that should be uh, promoted uh, educationally. Um, I, I also think that although people do get rewarded for sort of standing up on, on television and, and making confident pronouncements, part of the problem is they don't get penalized when the confident pronouncement turns out to be wrong. Uh, Professor Parsi, talked about sort of our, our amnesia. Um, there's so much amnesia on so many different levels, but one of it is um, people who are making public pronouncements uh, are rarely held to account for their history of, of getting it wrong. And that's an incentive system which is going to promote um, excessive confidence um, in our pronouncements. Uh, I'll stop there. Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you, Peter. Chelsea, for the students who come in with a really rich and challenging question, and want this sort of so similar question, want this short binary answer. Any recommendations from the library pers librarian perspective of helping you know, students and faculty sort of think through the informational resources? What, what do we do? Sure, um, so this is a practice that we already do and I'll keep it um, kind of short, but we try to draw the answer out of the, the faculty member, the student, the, the community member, you know, we, guide you and say, okay, what do you think of this? What do you derive from this? So we make them make their own determinations and we have them back it with why. What, what makes this credible? What makes this useful? And then they learn the process of vetting information on their own. So I, um, you know, that's something that we want to encourage people to do beyond school, you know, make your own decisions, go through, vet the information as much as you can. Um, so that's my very quick answer for the sake of time. I, yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate all the, 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 the way I've truncated all of your answers. So we are coming up um, right on our deadline of two o'clock. So um, we've muted everyone as we are doing these things. So um, thank you to all our panelists. Had we not, you'd be hearing, you know, echoing, uh, deafening applause um, for folks calling in. Uh, thank you so much for, um, you know, for being with us. Special thanks to the panelists. Um, as all of you who tune in regularly know, um, with the COVID ethics series, we get a bunch of smart folks together to help us think through challenging ethical questions. And I think we've been really lucky to have um, such excellent panelists. Um, also, if anyone is interested in further resources, check out our IHS library webpage where we have further resources here. Um, we'll post some comments and some other things from our panelists. And um, we've got some great recent papers coming out. I can't highlight them all. Um, I especially appreciated Professor uh, Parsi's recent co-authored paper um, about the importance of dentistry during this time. I've skipped the dentist with COVID fears, but um, there's just so much good work that's come out. Um, so please, yes, our information's up here. We'll put it in the chat. Go check out the IHS library page. Please feel free to tweet us um, at the um, 
tweeted you know, at our Twitter addresses below. And again, thanks so much to everyone who joined us and thanks very much to our panelists. Um, please have a good day everyone and stay safe.